On the end around. Carruth gets away for the first down marker. What a play by the rookie Ray Carruth. Carolina Panther Ray Carruth conspired to kill his pregnant girlfriend, Sharika Adams. The wonderful first date turned into a horrific plot for murder. All of us go through our death of a loved one sometimes. And when we focus on what we've lost, we don't see what we have left. So today my focus is on what I have left. When I was thinking of a name for Sharika, I had uh, thought of several different things. I wanted it to be unique because I knew she would just be a very unique uh, really vibrant type of person. She was almost about to be named after the vacuum cleaner, Eureka. Cause I thought, oh, that's got a nice little sound to it. And I thought, no, I don't want to, I don't want her to be associated with dirt and cleaning and stuff. So I said, since I love Cher so much, I want her to be tall and lean and long flowing black hair. I said, I'm going to name her Cher, but share just wasn't enough so i said well i put the two together so it was sherika she had the looks that could rival halle berry beyonce uh all the beautiful women out there sherika was absolutely a knockout she's really 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 pretty but she wasn't aware of how pretty she was um and I, not just her outer beauty sherika had the prettiest inside that I'd ever met. I wanted her to have someone that treated her like the beautiful queen that she was. But many times you cannot blame the heart for where the heart goes. Sharika and her girlfriend had gone to a pool party and there she met Ray Karouf. And she was pretty smitten with Ray Karouf when she met him and I think they must have had pretty good conversation and wanted to continue the conversation a little more privately. For whatever reason, she decided she wanted to go by her dad's house with him. So I don't know if that was some kind of intuition that she had that this might be a person that's forever in my life or what, but she felt comfortable enough taking him to meet her dad. What I picked up on him was that, of course, I could tell he was a playboy, a player, and uh, I thought he was a nice looking guy, but I didn't think he was nice looking on the inside. His uh, focus was pretty much on sports and football and women uh, back in the day. Berline throws, that is caught into the end zone, touchdown, Ray Carew. At that point, you're looking at him like a, like a Steve Smith was when he was young, and he came up on the scene, and you saw him um, developed through training camp and you saw the talent and you're like, oh, this guy gonna be good. When you see certain guys, you're like, okay, maybe in five years you might be reading by him and not in a good way, right? Um, but you never saw that with Ray. She was really, really disappointed in um, Ray's reaction to her pregnancy. She said that he's a want to be bad guy. She said, I don't understand why I thought maybe he would be happy that she told him, I'm gonna have my baby. I'm gonna have my baby, and if you're going to be there with me and my baby, then fine. If not, I have enough support. Number one, Baker, you need police, fire, oh, automatic. I was really I've been shot. I'm eight months pregnant. Okay, ma'am, you're eight months pregnant. You've been shot. You're at Wessex Square. Community. Okay, ma'am, I'm gonna connect you to Medic. Continue to talk to them, because ma'am, we have to help you. We have to find out where you are. Where's your husband at? Or your boyfriend, the one you said that was with you. Where's he at? He was in the car in front of me and he slowed down and so my foot up the time and did this. And then where did he go? He just left. Okay. All right, what's his name? Ray Caruthi. Okay, what's his name? Ray Caruthi. Ray Caruthi. The wonderful first date turned into a horrific plot for murder.
Ray Carruth had called me and he asked me if um, I had a hoop deal. A car that's not flashy, that doesn't stand out, that um, he could get that night. And um, I told him that I had a Maxima and he told me to, to come over his house. And uh, he asked me, do I know where he can get a gun at? I was like, why Why you want the gun? And he was like, he was wanting to um, get Sharika because she was pregnant and, and he could, he didn't want to pay no um, 5000 another 5000 or some odd dollars a month in child support. And um, then uh, people on the team were saying that he can't be having no baby by no stripper and stuff like that. He said that, um, that he had a friend that was going to do it, and he was talking about William. He called me, and I met him. So he said, how much would it take to beat up a girl and make her abort a baby? I said, I don't know, beat up no girl, I can't be. I told him that I didn't want to do it. I was like, I don't want to, you know, I don't have no part. And I said, because I mean, anything can happen, I could get killed or anything. And he was like, um, something still can happen to you regardless because you know about it. So he had a cold before. I don't want the dog to get out. I need the fence. And that was the cold. He don't want the baby to get out. He needs Sharika killed. What I want, he said, I want my man to ride with you. He was talking about William. He said, ride with you. He said, when we leave the movies, he said, I'm going to call you, and I want y'all to follow me down this road right here. He was going to stop, and he wanted the guy that was riding with us to um, to shoot the girl that he had pregnant. And I was just so scared, I didn't, I didn't say nothing else. I didn't think she was there that night. Because I had the back, I seen like her brake lights like blink on. So I didn't think she was dead then. I just remember dropping to my knees and just wailing. Just, God, just please don't let my baby die. But when I got there, they met me and told me that Sharika was already in surgery to have the baby by cesarean section. I immediately decided, oh my God, I gotta call Ray because I bet he doesn't know what's happened. You know, somehow she got shot going home or whatever. And I'm like, I gotta call him. So I had two numbers. I had a cell phone number uh, and a beeper number for him. And so I just continually just kept calling both, both, no answer. During that time before he came, I remember, you know, they came out and told me that they had to revive Chancellor and uh, that he had severe damage to his brain because of the lack of oxygen and blood. And so, you know, you're hearing all this from the doctors and, and still no Ray. And finally, he comes in with an entourage. Ray comes in with the guy that did go to the movies with him. It was his friend Hannibal. And he actually came with another woman. I went over like a mad woman. I let him know that I know you, you knew what happened to her. You know what happened to her and you did it, you did it. He finally said he wanted to go see his son. So we got down to the NICU and they let us in and Chancellor is hooked up to all these tubes and in the incubator and everything. The nurse was telling us, you know, we couldn't take him out, but we could stick our finger in to touch him or whatever. So I do remember asking him if he wanted to touch him. And he said, no, he just wanted to get a picture of him. And he said, because this might be the last time I get to see him. I had so much peace about making the decision to take Sharika off of life support because she was existing. She was not living. When she died, she looked like she did when she was born. And it was such a surreal moment for me. He got a message on his answering machine from his attorney who said that Shrinka Adams had passed away. About 10 o'clock that night, he decided, I'm going to contact an old friend, Wendy Cole. And he said he begged her to take him to California. 
My reaction to Ray fleeing to Tennessee with yet another girlfriend was just another very big display of his cowardice. I received a call from the FBI in Charlotte and telling me that they have an arrest warrant for Ray Carruth. And they had developed information that he was in a motel in Wildersville, Tennessee. So we went into the hotel, spoke to the manager, and she told us, yes, there was a young lady, Wendy Cole, staying in that room. And a short time later, Miss Cole walked down. I asked her if Greg Cruz was with her. She said, no. I said, where is he at? She said, well, I'm not sure, but he's around here. Down, I sat down on the side of the bed and I said, you know where he is, don't you? She just stared and then I said, where is he, Wendy? And she looked at the keys. And I didn't pick up on it the first time. I said, where is he, Wendy? And she looked at the keys again. He's in the trunk, isn't he? I said, Ray? She said, yeah. This is Mark Post. I'm with the FBI and I have agents surrounded the car. We're going to pop the trunk. As soon as we pop the trunk, just enough for your hands to come out. That's the first thing I want to see is those hands come out. And his hands came right out. Yes, I had concerns, but uh, on the other hand, we had Sharika Adams, and uh, she was the strongest witness for herself to her own murder. 911, Baker, any police, fire, oh, automatic. Oh, please, I've been shot. I'm eight months pregnant. Okay, ma'am, you're eight months pregnant. You've been shot. You're at Wessex Square. That was probably the largest piece of evidence in the entire trial, and, and they, they pulled it out on day one, minute one. It just showed the courage and the strength of this young woman and, and her character that uh, she was fighting to hold on to life long enough to tell somebody what had happened and who had done it and to try to save her baby. Yeah, I don't have any doubt that that was the most important evidence. Uh, and I have no doubt that whatever Sharika said was her honest impression at the time. Ma'am, can you give me any information about what kind of car it was? No. Where's your husband at? I don't have one. Or your boyfriend, the one you said that was with you. Where's he, he at? He's in the car in front of me and he slowed down and somebody pulled up and said, I'm this. And then where'd he go? He just left. Okay. All right, what's his name? Ray Caruso. Ray Caruso. Okay, what's his name? Ray Caruso. Ray Caruso. Uh, the part that she said, uh, I think she said number 89 or number 88 or whatever number he was. I'm having his baby. He stopped in front of me and they started shooting. I, I don't remember the, all the exact words, but something to that effect. And, and I was kind of thinking to myself, would I have the wherewithal to come up with that stuff if I'd been just, just been shot? How you couldn't help but believe her seemed almost impossible to me. You know, I have never believed that he hired Van Brett Watkins or Michael Kennedy uh, to harm Sharika in any way. Uh, and the evidence at the trial was that neither of them got paid anything or received anything for doing this. Uh, and indeed, there was no, quote, planning for this until the very day that it all happened. And that's just, that's just not how a murder for hire takes place. Uh, I mean, they even had to go and get a gun that day. Uh, so uh, the whole thing just didn't make sense to me. My impression of David was that he came up with an alternate set of possibilities that were never backed up by anything in the testimony that I ever heard. As we got more into the trial and as we got into deliberations, uh, we kept going back to that 911 call. And we just, you know, couldn't wrap our, 
our hands around why would she say some of the things she said at this moment if they weren't true. That was probably 90% of why I voted the way I voted. Did you say, I hope the bitch dies? Did you say that? That's the bitch I was talking about. Oh, I see. Ray Carew, that's your client, the bitch. Nobody wanted to be within arm's length of Van Brett Watkins. I was very glad the marshals were between me and him. <laughs> he had a look in his eyes that I, I, I've maybe only seen once or twice in my life. It was the look of, I can do whatever I want to do to whoever I want to do it to. If you pushed enough of Van Brett Watkins' buttons, you could see what a violent anger management problem he had. So you're sort of a hitman without a weapon. Is that what you are? If that's what you want to say. Well, that's what you were, according to you. If that's what you, I could kill you with my hands. Okay. Is that what you were? I could kill you with my hands. And the court uh, was convinced by uh, Carew's attorney to uh, find him to be a hostile witness to them, even though they were calling him, and allowed them to cross-examine him. They, uh, I, I use the term, pushed him to the point where he uh, at one point, I actually threatened uh, Carew's attorney. And so did he say, well, you go on back and you go get that gun because I don't need to be spending another $200 and having Mr. Kennedy running all around all night looking for a gun. When I didn't need a gun. Okay, to, for me to kill somebody, I don't need a gun. Can't you look and see? I'm 286 pounds. Okay, I would rip you like a rag doll. I'm 286 pounds, and I could rip you limb from limb like a little rag doll. I'll tear you up like a rag doll. I'll shake you like a rag doll. I could rip you apart like a rag doll. Right after that, I said, I have no further questions. I'm done, Your Honor. Anything further? You're right about that. I mean, you go back in that jury room, and you look at each other, and you think, oh, my God. You know. Did that just happen? That influenced me. This guy was dangerous, uh, without a soul. The ball was dropped because the judge asked them if that was the only thing they would consider was first degree murder. And I think they were so overconfident that the conspiracy and the murder charge would go together that they didn't even put second degree on the table for Ray. What he did was a very horrific and just unimaginable thing. And it deserves the harshest punishment. He deserves to be dead for what he did to my daughter. I think he should have been convicted of first-degree murder, and uh, everything that we saw in court backed that up. David Rudolph didn't come up with any good alternative explanation for the facts that we had. I wouldn't have had any problem dispensing the, the death sentence if that would work out. They found him guilty of everything he told them would make him guilty of first-degree murder. They found him guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, aiding and abetting, if you will, acting in concert. They found him guilty of firing into an occupied vehicle, felony murder. And in addition, they found him guilty of trying to kill the unborn child. Then they found him not guilty of first-degree murder, which they did not follow the law. At one point, I asked a question, uh, is there anybody in here who doesn't think Carruth is up to this in up to his eyeballs, and uh, everybody said, yes, they agreed that he was. But we still had a juror who would not go for the first degree. So uh, we did have a compromise um, verdict. Uh, we said, okay, we'll agree that he's guilty of all the lesser charges, but we'll say we cannot convict on first degree. 
and that's the way it went down. I think in some, some strange way, the jury sort of figured it out and sort of compromised to a place that, you know, even Ray can accept, okay, I get it. I, I, I'm responsible for, for this situation, so I needed to pay a price. And so, you know, I, I'm not sitting here declaring victory, but in a strange sort of way, I think, you know, the jury probably got it right. There was no winner in this case. I mean, it was a, just a tragedy all around. After the verdict, you know, I mentioned I, my admiration for Sandra Adams. She asked us to join her in a room outside the courtroom. She and Jeff and Wanda and, and Jeff Jr. and some other uh, friends and relatives, I guess, of theirs, uh, formed a circle. And she prayed. Prayed for us. Prayed for Ray Carruth. Prayed for Van Brett Watkins. It was an incredibly moving moment. I'll never forget. Now, what do you call your grandmother? Kim Fa. And what do you call um, your mother? Fa. There you go. Mommy Angel. Can you yeah. say it again? Mommy. Hey, girl. Mommy Angel, that's right. I'm raising Ray Carruth's son, and I don't believe that there's any way that I could hate a part of Chancellor and say that I love him unconditionally. It, I just, you can't do that. So to love him unconditionally would be to love every part of Chancellor, and Ray Carruth is a part of Chancellor. Chancellor does not think he's disabled. He is abled differently. So he does not conduct himself like a helpless person. That strong athletic ability that Chancellor has and he displays when he's doing his therapy, and it's not even just therapy, it's the day-to-day -day task that we take so much for granted that he has to put so much effort into doing. I see Sharika coming through that fight and that determination. And I must give credit to Ray Carruth because I think Ray has some of those same qualities because you couldn't make it to the NFL just being mediocre. Mm -hmm. I'm almost grateful that it happened because it has shown me a part of me that I didn't know lived in there. I am bigger than I thought I was. I am more faithful than I thought I was. I'm more loving and compassionate than I ever thought I could be. And for that, I really have Ray Caruth to thank. Van Brett Watkins was the only one of the four that actually reached out to me to ask for some forgiveness uh, in the beginning. And he expressed remorse and I believed him. Van Brett Watkins sent me a letter expressing that and I did write back to him. And it's dated April 18th in 2003. And I said to him, Mr. Watkins, you know I am suffering. Because of your actions, I will never be able to hold my beautiful daughter Sharika again. Because of your actions, my grandson Chancellor cannot do the simplest things, like call me grandmommy or play ball with the other children. But despite my grief, I want you to know that I have forgiven you. I know you are suffering too for the horrible choice you made that day. I want you to know that you will always be in my thoughts and prayers, and I wish you peace. Sandra Adams. I don't even want to see Ray Carruth go to hell. I want him to come to repentance, because Ray is never going to have peace 
in his life until he tells the truth. In the past, I didn't think it mattered that he just do his time, get out, be free, go along his way. But I think as the time gets closer for him to get out, I am feeling very differently. Part of me wants to be there the day he walks out so he can acknowledge his son. And then there's part of me that just wants to be chilling out on a beach somewhere on October 22nd and not even thinking about that it's October 22nd. Come here. You see Mommy Angel's grace? Yeah. Huh? Aren't those pretty? Yeah. Sharika Adams. Yeah. Mommy Angel. I think it's written in all sincerity, mm -hmm. and um, I believe he's doing his best to warn me of the person that he knows. And um, I actually feel some of the same kind of way. Ray would never come back here and do anything, but that doesn't mean he wouldn't send someone. So I am a little anxious, and I'm not gonna live in fear, but I'm taking a lot of precautions because he usually gets somebody else to do his dirty work and we're gonna protect Lee. Careers release marking another chapter in a story that uh, has gripped Charlotte's history. Caruth was found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, shooting into an occupied vehicle and using an instrument to destroy an unborn child. And he is starting to walk out right now. 